Hi, everyone. I've got beautiful chocolate in my lap. Fluffy's downstairs chasing bugs at a screen door. He may, probably will come through and you'll get to see his tail. He uh, likes to jump up on the desk every once in a while. And chocolate is this dear, dear life that reminds me how precious, really, really precious life is every day. And I wanted you all to know we broke through 144,000 subscriptions this week. So we are closer and closer to that 150,000 mark and celebrating with cold champagne around the world. Am I taking as many questions from all of you as I can answer in two hours? I've been getting some emails from people saying, Linda, we've got champagne cold in the refrigerator. And that just makes me feel so good because we really do need all of each other. And Chocolate and Fluffy will be with us the whole celebration. And remember last week, there was a question about the hollow earth theory. And I was explaining how the center of our planet is an enormous crystal iron sphere, about 70% the diameter of the moon. And it rotates in a river of liquid iron well, that's why we know that our planet's core is not hollow, but that there are other big structural mysteries between the core and the solid mantle. And I'm gonna put my beloved chocolate down so you can go play too. And then I'm gonna explain something new that is being discovered over the last couple of years. And it was last week on June 12th, 2020, there was news from the University of Maryland in the AAAS Science Journal about the first comprehensive view of the core mantle boundary over a very wide area with very detailed resolution, unprecedented, and using an algorithm to look for anomalies and echoes from seismic waves, the geophysicists were able to analyze thousands of seismic wave recordings instead of the few that they've been able to in the past. And these are what are called ultra low velocity zone frequencies or ULVZ. And the result was the discovery of huge structures at the Earth's core mantle boundary that were never known before. Two hot spots for seismic wave echoes between Earth's molten iron core and the solid mantle layer above are marked by yellow triangles. They're sort of small, but I hope you can see them in the illustration. And one is the, at the strong echo site in the Marquesas Islands in the South Pacific from as deep as 1,800 miles or 2,900 kilometers at the earth core and solid mantle boundary. That's where they come together. And this huge deep structure there is 621 miles in diameter and 15 miles thick and no one knows what it is. And here is another surprising huge structure found a couple of years ago in another study below Africa. And what energy? See all of that red to the blue, the yellow, the green? That's coming up from where the core comes up to the mantle. All of that structure goes all the way up to under the land, the very thin crust land that we live on, but think about all of this structure underneath. And the question is, what energy drives the creation of such huge structures coming from the mantle core boundary up? University of Maryland professor of geology, Vedran Lekic says, quote, these are among the largest things inside the earth, and yet we literally do not know what they are where they came from, how long they've been around, or what they do, close quote. Miles above. On this date of Wednesday, June 17, 2020, COVID-19 
has infected, as of this date, over 8 million people. At 7 p.m. Mountain Time tonight, the number was 8,393,096. And the total deaths around the world on this date at 7 p.m. Mountain, 450,452 deaths with no sign of COVID really letting go. But six months ago, on December 17, 2019, a consortium of radio telescopes with an international team of astronomers aimed 64 meerkat radio dishes shown in this astonishing photograph to observe and photograph the sky together for a total of 130 hours, not in visible light, but in radio frequencies. So those are not stars. What the radio telescopes show are tens of thousands of galaxies, each one filled with millions of stars. And then this week came headlines like this one in the UK's Guardian. Scientists say most likely number of contactable alien civilizations is 36. Well, this new research was led by Christopher Kinsellis, PhD. He's a professor of astrophysics at the University of Nottingham in England. He updated what has been known since 1961 as the Drake Equation. 59 years ago, astronomer Frank Drake was a colleague of Carl Sagan's at Cornell University, where he devised an equation of factors to calculate an estimate for the number of intelligent life civilizations in this universe. The number of calculated civilizations varied depending upon what factors were used. Well, now, 59 years after Drake's equation, Professor Kinsellis has refined a new equation in which he says, quote, basically, we made the assumption that intelligent life would form on other Earth-like planets like it has on Earth. So within a few billion years, life would automatically form as a natural part of evolution, close quote. Well, when Professor Kinsellis's list of factors were fed into a computer, the conclusions were that there are between four and 211 civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy alone, capable of communicating with other intelligent life forms. And there are trillions of galaxies. But the professor thinks that a conservative and best estimate for the number of civilizations in this Milky Way galaxy only that humans could realistically contact is 36 right now. Professor Kinsellis said, if we do find intelligent things closer, then that would be a good indication that the lifespan of communicating civilizations is much longer than a hundred or a few hundred years, <clears throat> that an intelligent civilization can last for thousands or millions of years. And the more we find nearby us and our solar system, the better it looks for the long-term survival of our own civilization, close quote. Other astronomers who are eager for future missions in our own solar system to Europa, Enceladus, and Titan, those exotic moons of Jupiter and Saturn, where life forms might already exist, are being planned. And the great irony for me is that I have been investigating and reporting since 1979 about animal mutilations, human abductions, Sasquatch, UFOs, all as evidence on this planet Earth of one or more other non-human intelligences that cohabit with us on our planet and throughout the solar system and beyond. Government and military whistleblowers have told me since the early 1980s that the U.S. government has been trying to understand and cope 
with three competing in conflict extraterrestrial biological entity civilizations that have used Earth as a laboratory for at least 270 million years. According to whistleblowers, one of the main goals of other intelligences interacting with Earth is genetic harvesting and gene manipulation to create human body containers that can be used by non-humans that have technology to transfer consciousness and life force and maybe even some souls into and out of body containers. I have a 106 page chapter about all of this in my third book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness. And that book was first released all the way back to 1998. And now this is June 2020. And after last week's Earth Files broadcast, I received an email from a former U.S. Army intelligence analyst who has so far survived dangerous heart surgery for five bypasses. He senses that his time here is short, and he wanted to share with me some of the revelations he learned about non-humans on Earth during his Army assignments in Fort Huachuca in Arizona and the Kunia Tunnel on Oahu, Hawaii. Edward Kenneth Abbott sent me a copy of his DD-214 that showed he entered the Army in December of 2006 at age 34, older than most enlistees, and was assigned to work as an Army intelligence analyst from 2007 to 2009. He was retired early because of a physical disability caused during his Army work. At the beginning, in December of 2006, Eddie did basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, got out the beginning of March 2007, and headed for advanced individual training at Fort Huachuca in southwestern Arizona for 16 weeks until September of 2007. I'm showing on this map that down in the far right corner there's Fort Huachuca, and you come up on a line that goes right up to the upper left corner, and you pass through Tucson and Phoenix, and where do you end up? About 500 miles northwest. That's Nellis Air Force Base and Area 51 outside of Las Vegas. Then he was stationed in Hawaii at Schofield Barracks in the S-3 headquarters for the 500th Military Intelligence Brigade, known as the 500th MIBDE. It was housed inside of the famous Kunia Tunnel, built in World War II when it was safer to hide military operations underground and inside of hills. Their motto is knowledge is strength. And Eddie Abbott is haunted by what he learned in Arizona and the Kunia Tunnel on Oahu, Hawaii. During the war, the Kunia Tunnel, the bottom yellow circle in this area, was constructed so that its surface would look like a farm, but military operations were hidden inside a huge tunnel dug into a hill. The Regional Signal Intelligence Operations Center there evolved into the National Security Agency's Hawaii Cryptologic Center on the island of Oahu, Hawaii in 2012. That facility, also known as the HCC, or NSA Hawaii, became famous when CIA employee and subcontractor Edward Snowden in 2013 took many classified documents about global surveillance programs and distributed them to the media, revealing the existence of several top secret mass surveillance programs run by the NSA and the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance, 
with telecommunication com companies and European governments. In Hawaii, he was amazed by the Kunia Tunnel that he said had been serving American troops underground since World War II. And here now is Edward Keith Abbott. The Kunia Tunnel. That is right next to Schofield. And if you're heading down the road from Schofield towards the ocean, mm -hmm. you run right into the Kunia Tunnel, and it's underground. It's a gigantic place buried in the mountain. And what happens there? The Kunia Tunnel is basically everything anybody ever says on a phone, on a computer. Those guys are down there, and they're listening to everything. And there's one spot in there that this lieutenant was telling us about that he worked in, and it was called Otherworldly Communications. And I'm like, what? He's like, there's only eight of us. No enlisted, just officers. We're all linguists, and we just listen all day to otherworldly communications. Come on now. If we're talking about aliens, who can communicate with an alien? And he said that we have been doing this for a very long time, that we're already traveling in space. And I remember seeing them coming down. They were wearing, like, black uniforms. Only thing on their sleeve was a blue circle with a red pointer coming up the top on the left arm. We were told they were space program guys. This is 2007. A space program? What the hell is a space program? They're already in space and on the moon. And there is a dialect. And we do have linguists that understand the dialect. So then, two weeks later, a couple of guys I knew that worked in the Cunha Tunnel, I pulled aside and I said, listen, man. That lieutenant said there's a place called Otherworldly Communications. And they said, there is, man. We can't even go in the hallway over there. And then you find out why we're in Iraq, because there's some artifacts that we have to get out of Iraq. We went to Iraq because we wanted to plunder some kind of artifacts they were looking for. He confirmed this. That were extraterrestrial from the ancient beginnings of ETs being here. Did anybody say that to you? Yeah, they said that there were some artifacts from, God, who knows how long ago, that were extremely important, and they were from other civilizations that came to Earth and started the whole program. The whole program? And one of the officers said, that this is our fourth time, fourth civilization on Earth that has been this far or even further along than we are. Let's just hope we make it. What does that mean, <laughs> hope we make it. Who is someone going to take us all out? And he indicated with his eyes that, yeah, <laughs> we could be taken out if we do it wrong. Did you say, what could we do wrong? No, I did not. I wish I would have asked more questions. You know, when you're talking to an officer, you kind of, you tiptoe with it because you don't know. You might offend him, and then now I'm going to get a pay cut, you know. And everything seemed to be very, like, touchy. The people were talking and I think what it is, when you're in the military, you're more apt to talk to each other about things because you know everybody's under, you know, to keep a secret. So it just seemed, now I'm going to get killed because I'm learning this stuff, you know? So then after all this is going on, I'm home with my kids. This is in November now. I'm home, and I live just two blocks from the ocean in Eva Beach. So James Campbell Highway runs out at my house. I'm in a gated subdivision. You have to have a comm to get in. There's only my family and this old couple right next to James Campbell High School. I'm still talking about Hawaii. So it's like 4.30 in the afternoon. I'm outside washing my motorcycle down. The kids are playing. And I look up because I heard something. You know, it got real quiet. And I look up, and there's a craft sitting above the neighborhood just next to mine. And I froze. And my kids looked up. Dad, what is that? I don't know what that is. I sent you the pictures. It was that bent V shape. I never studied craft like this. I don't remember seeing anything like this in any briefings or anything. And I grabbed my phone and I took some pictures. And the pictures I sent you, that's the best I could get them. Every time I would take them, they were screwing up. I check them, I take it. And it was like distorted picture. Why are my pictures going so crazy? So I managed to get three good shots, but my phone was almost inoperable the whole time this thing was around. So for about 45 minutes, this crap just sat there. Not a sound. It didn't move at all. Then you could hear two jets coming. 
And as the two jets were coming behind me on my left, this is where the jets were coming from, Pearl Harbor area, from Hickam to my right and my back, two Blackhawks were coming. So I'm like, oh, boy, what's going on here? And this thing started to move. And it was so quiet. It was like it just subtly drifted towards Diamond Head. And as the jets got closer and the helicopters got closer, this thing was like gone. And you could see it, but you could tell it's miles away instantly. And it went straight down into the water. I'm like, what the hell did I just see happen here? And what did the two Blackhawks do? They all went out where it went, and they circled. So now they got this search party going, and it happened through the night. You know, I sat outside in the dark in my porch smoking cigarettes and watching these guys circle the same area. So whatever went in the water, they were desperately trying to find it. Definitely not ours. I got pictures of this thing. Holy cow. Were you able then to ask as a Army analyst in Intel? I took my pictures back to the base, my phone. I had made copies of them just in case. So I took pictures back, and I'm like, you know what I saw last night? Yeah, we don't talk about that. What do you mean we don't talk about that? Like, listen, Abbott, you're new here. Believe me, it's not the first time. And then I got a call to the office of Colonel Grove. He's the CO. And I go in the office. I stand at attention. Specialist, did you bring your cell phone with you? No, sir, I did not. It's sitting outside of S3. He told one of the lieutenants to go get my phone. I brought my phone in. He took my phone. And he took my card out of my phone. He said, if you ever take a picture of anything like that again and you do not report to me, I'll take care of you. You're dismissed. My phone was given to me with no card. Thank God I backed up the pictures on my home computer. Yeah, I went from being lighthearted to very serious and pissed off that I took pictures. As if I was to know better not to even talk about that stuff. Edward Abbott was confused about why Commanding Officer Colonel Grove would be so angry about the three cell phone images that Eddie didn't think were very good and that they were of whatever it was the two Nighthawk helicopters chased. Eddie already had been told confidentially a lot about aliens and UFOs at his previous intelligence training assignment in Fort Huachuca, Arizona. And that's why he always looked for UFOs to photograph. Honest to God, at Fort Huachuca, They have labs under there, and if you go near the mesas and you mess around with the mesas, look out, they will get you. Who will get you? The aliens that are under the mesa. They are there, and they have been there long before us, I was told. Long before us. And that they've already dug themselves in. We've never noticed them because they did all this so long ago. They're already embedded. So now you start wondering, are the people that are saying stuff about Archuleta Mesa telling the truth? Because what I heard is that's the truth, that... We work with them under some kind of a treaty. Supposedly, one of our presidents made a treaty. It's supposed to be Eisenhower. Was it? Okay, they never said it. They said one of our presidents, and that they agreed to give people to them to do their experiments in exchange for technology and for us not to go back to the moon or something because there's helium something on the moon. I remember that, too. And probably animal mutilations were part of that treaty as well. They were allowed. Yeah, I know that they're supposedly mixing with our seeds, and they have to have a place to house that embryo. So I know that that's what they're doing. They're housing the embryo at a certain point. They remove it from the cattle. That's one thing that everybody talked about, stuff like that. People that know what's going on, older people that have been in the military 20, 30 years, will actually talk about that, and they'll laugh. And they'll say, everybody thinks it's us in our black helicopters, and it's not us. They're just growing babies. Like, wow, that's sickening. Major Hollowell, I think his name was, he's the one that confirmed that that's what they do. And he used to say, yeah, they always think that it's something to do with our government. They think the black helicopter's got something to do. It's not. They're growing babies, and that's the safest way to grow babies, sight unseen, so that they can have their hybrid babies come out of these cattle. And did anybody say to you, there is X percent of alien, homo sapien, sapien hybrids on planet Earth? They never said a percentage, but they said that they're walking among us all the time, and we walk right past them. And that's how close they look to us, that they will fool anyone. And what do you understand is the biggest picture in relationship to why 
extraterrestrials based on Earth before Homo sapiens sapien ever stood up, i.e. Homo erectus in Africa two million years ago is the first standing up primate that we recognize. If the extraterrestrials have been based on our planet and the moon and Mars and other planets in our solar system and beyond for, let's say, 270 million years, way before Homo sapiens sapien ever came into existence. Why would our human governments make treaties that would give technology in exchange for extraterrestrials to take humans from the surface? I was told this is our fourth time. We're no threat to them at all. The only thing that we're threatening is ruining the planet. But we're not a threat. And they don't want to eliminate us, but this is the fourth time. Supposedly, they had this experimentalist society of a crossbreed, and we're number four. Supposedly, technology before us was way further advanced than what we are now, but it's eliminated. We can't even find it because it's eliminated. Why? Why is it eliminated? They eliminate it. Supposedly, they eliminated society before this one. But why? Because we're a warring people, and we cannot be controlled unless we fight each other, and everything that we do is destructive. So every society before us was destructive, and we're just going down the same path. We're destructive. It's just in our makeup. And I think they're trying to create something better. I think the whole goal is, from what I hear, from just listening to these people talk, is they want a better society. They want a better human hybrid. What you have just heard is an approximately 11 minute segment out of a two full hour recorded interview that I did with Eddie Abbott last weekend. And when we got into about the end of what we'll be say about 90 minutes in, and there's a whole lot more to report. To my surprise, he began with emotion to talk about the fact that we're on a planet and he and so many others who have served in the military or served in intel or served in science and the fact of other intelligences cohabiting with us on our planet, living, sometimes being involved with military skirmishes, other discussions that we collaborate with some. All of that, he said, I know that since I had the heart with the five bypasses, he said, I, I know that I'm not long for here. And I'm glad that we have been able to talk in depth today. And he said, and Linda, I know there is a God. I know that there is an after of the passing and death. And I just asked him simply, I said, how do you know? And he said, because of the near-death experience that I had that was so dramatic. And we spent the whole next 30 minutes with him going into a vivid detail. And next week, what I'm going to do is share with you that near-death experience by Eddie Abbott and then an entirely unexpected surprise of content that he was exposed to in his intelligence analyst work. And when you hear it, I'll have more to say. You'll be as astonished, I think, as I was and am. And Eddie, if you're there on the other side of the electrons, thank you very much for sharing this very, very valuable insight from your time before you had the physical trauma and had to retire from military service early. But in those two years, what you saw, what you heard, what you learned is 
another one of those pieces adding to this huge puzzle. What do the governments of this world know? And why are they keeping everything about other life forms interacting and living on the same planet from all of us? You and I talked about how unfair it is. And so many other people that I know in the abduction syndrome, that they think this is unfair, that they're we even have an interstellar trade operation out of Cyber Command in Washington, and nobody is to know. So thank you, Eddie. Thank you. And I hope that your example tonight, that there are others out there who have had similar types of experiences where they've had firsthand discussions with people who do have firsthand knowledge of the non-humans that we actively have interacting with our planet. And I think that some of them are down in those areas that we are now for the very first time in science discovering that there are these structures and the structures might be related to the places that the DIA guy told me back in December of 1999, the three competing civilizations, they choose to go down through the basins of the oceans and the seas, huge structures where they have been occupying for millions of years, and others inside of mountains. So you bring all of this together, it is beginning to form a picture that is coming into focus. And next Wednesday, you're going to hear amazing amazing insights from Eddie Abbott for a part two. And now, Peggy, what is going on in chats and questions and... Are you there? Oh, our, we have a, a speaker communication with Peggy and unbeknownst to us, Sometimes it just shuts itself down. We don't have a, we don't know. And so I'm waiting for Peggy's delightful voice. I'm here, is the speaker up and running? Oh, yes, now we can hear you. And uh, I'm curious what questions and comments people have. Great, first I'd love to thank everybody for their super chats. So thank you, Vicki Martinez, Moonbird, Anthony Gon, Martine Dolores Graff, Mike Martin, Rachel R, Ray Leoneda, Mylene 69, 2010, and Calla Lily from California. Thank you everybody for your super chats. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I take it that that means that you like this work and that you're sending a, please keep going. And I want to, and I am so grateful that there are so many of you out there now who appreciate, because this is hard work, <laughs> but I love doing it. And uh, the more we can break through on where the lies and the deceptions are and what the truth is, uh, the happier I'll be, and I think you will too. So thank you, thank you. Our first question comes from a viewer who would love to know if you've ever researched UFO or alien reports from Puerto Rico. He says he's from an island and they have tons of alleged UFO reports over the years. In 1996, I joined a group of people who were going to Puerto Rico because of uh, the Chupacabra attacks. And I was there for about 10 days traveled every place on the island. They had animal mutilations also while I was there at only one end of the island. Meanwhile, the chupacabras attacks were in many places. And I'll tell you two moments in that trip to Puerto Rico about the strange chupacabra that I have never forgotten have left an indent in my memory. One was a couple who had like a, 
like a little farm ranch. Uh, they had some horses and they also grew plants and they had a dog, beautiful dog, a large dog, um, breed looking like sort of like a Labrador, but, but a beige, the beige Labrador look. This is important because uh, when we got uh, communication that they had had an attack, we went directly there. And I was able to see freshly on this beautiful dog that right on the right side of the neck, close to the jaw, jaw line, was a hole, quarter of an inch, uh, we didn't have the right instrument that in, in mutilations, a lot of times you carry something and you can measure because uh, the cattle and horses also have these holes that can be like biopsies coming out of their necks or their chest. And in this case, in the dog, I can't tell you exactly how deep it went, but it was about exactly a quarter of an inch. And the dog is walking, it is fresh, and there is not any fluid, there's nothing, there's no stain around that hole in this dog's neck. And then when the owner who saw the attack, it wasn't the creature that was described as about five foot two with some kind of a crest here, strange grayish, a little bit of pink skin hairs, but like one every few inches. Very, very odd description of the so-called chupacabras with some kind of uh, protuberance in the mouth that may have been used for doing punctures. No, what the uh, man described in detail, having seen the attack on his dog, he said it looked like a large bat with red glowing eyes, and it was daytime when this occurred, and that the bat or the flying whatever had come and circled. He was with the dog and came down swooping, uh, grabbed a hold or what, whatever this thing was on the back of the neck of the dog. And the, I believe if I'm recalling correctly that the dog did yelp and the owner is now running and whatever this thing was, took off soaring up with these big black wings. And he said that it was like looking at red taillights on a car. You know, sometimes I've asked people, do you think this was artificial intelligence? Like it wasn't organic doing this attack? Nobody ever knows. So that dog survived, thank heavens, but I will never forget, it was so fresh and it was just this perfect quarter inch tunneled, like a biopsy had been taken from this dog. Now, the next one, we got a phone call that a mother and her daughter have been cleaning inside of a house on a street across from a auto mechanic garage where they had had several reports of people seeing the chupacabras five foot-ish type of thing standing up on back legs and sometimes they would see it go down and sometimes spring over like six foot chain link fences. So th there were a lot of descriptions of that particular creature, which is very different from the uh, black bat, red-eyed thing. But this car place, for whatever reason, there was even speculation, was this being interested in looking at the car motors or the cars or, well, why was it uh, seen several times hanging around this car garage? It was right across the street, probably no more than 200 feet from a chain link fence going into the car place and a sidewalk where the house was right on the sidewalk, like you would be living in a city instead of having grass. 
And that window was probably about uh, seven, eight feet by five feet, something like that, filled up pretty much a big piece of the wall. And I got to meet through a translator and talk with the mother and daughter, and they took me into the house, and they took me to the window and said they were cleaning. One of them was dusting and one of them had something, and they were right by the window. So the mother and daughter were right together, and now I'm looking out at the sidewalk where I had just come from in. And they started telling me from where they were that all of a sudden, moving very slowly, but about five foot, they compared it to me. I'm five foot two. And if I were out on the sidewalk walking by their window, they said it, that would have probably been about the right height, but they had never seen anything like it. And th they sketched it. They sketched it for me, and, and everything I'm telling you is a story that I did uh, eventually for uh, some of my earthfiles.coms going back when I started Earth Files in 1999 uh, that I have chupacabra stories from that period of time. And they were both talking through a translator about how this slowly came and that they are right there. It's right there. Here's the window. Here they are, just like I am, came from the sidewalk and said they could clearly see it had three toes, only three fingers, this strange, thin little pieces of hair, eyes that were like this slanted, big almonds, I believe. And this was very interesting. Instead of black, they said, and they actually pointed out a piece of gray plastic, gray plastic, shiny, so solid gray, so almost cement gray, like a sidewalk. And that as it went by, it was dangling the three front three fingers and leap. And it leaped into the street and it bounded over to where the mechanics were and went over a chain link fence that was about six feet high. And that was probably the most dramatic first-hand chupacabra report that I ever heard and was able to experience because when you're on this side of the window and something like that comes along and the only thing that's separating you is this window, they really got a great look. What is that creature? What is the black bat with the red eyes that glowed like the taillights of a car? That is how strange it was in Puerto Rico in 1996. And there were similar descriptions of exactly that same kind of being in Mexico and a few other places it had begun to spread out. And then by 97, 98, there was not any real chupacabras reports in the way that it came like a wave in 1996. And I often wonder what was going on in the big, let's say, three-way competition of whatever it is that competes with our planet and on our planet. What might have been happening in 1996 that something like this showed up for a period of several weeks, especially in Puerto Rico. And it was just everywhere. And I even was invited to go to the uh, medical center at the university uh, in San Juan. And there were uh, doctors, there were investigators. I was there as an invited reporter from the United States. And there were two medical doctors who gave a presentation with photographs of all those bloodless, strange puncture holes in the breasts of chicken, in rabbits, in ducks, in dogs, in goats, in sheep, in cattle. I, I don't think there were horses. And that they, they medically were stumped 
because these were, in all cases, just like the dog, the punctures were absolutely clean. No clotted blood and no evidence on feathers, on hair, on fur, that there ever was blood. And yet, all of these puncture marks that were being shown at the University of, uh, in Puerto Rico were at least a quarter of an inch in diameter and going into the bodies. So that's the chupacabra mystery. And then, which by the way, chupacabra means goat sucker uh, to the people who live in Puerto Rico, putting in something and sucking blood. Uh, in the big, large animals, going back to at least the 19, early 1960s, it has always been the lack of blood on all of the many excisions of removed tissue in animals, plus no tracks, that has always se separated them from predator, disease, satanic cult, or other things. So that, dear Peggy, uh, is a, a part of fascinating research that I had face-to-face -face and firsthand in Puerto Rico. We had somebody ask another question about the chupacabra, and they were wondering, do you think it's from another planet? You know, that is a very good question. Would you make a mark that next week, after we hear from Eddie Abbott for part two, that that would be a very good question to talk about during Q&A next week. We'll mark that down. Yeah. I have another question regarding animal mutilations. A viewer would like to know, do you think mutilation, mutilations are done by means involving time dilation or stopping time? This would make sense as to how they can pull them off so fast in pure stealth. That is a very intelligent question. It really is. Um, I wish I had absolutely hard data answers. But what I can do is bring up, this was a solid case. I believe I talked about this with Bud Hopkins when he was alive. It was a woman was in a car. She's driving on a street. Everything is normal. The next microsecond, the car is not moving. It's stopped next to a curb. She has no memory whatsoever of doing anything except driving her car. When Questions were asked for her to go through the minutia of details. Where are your hands? This often helps when you're working with people in abductions uh, because what's happened is missing time. And what we're talking about is the essence of what does missing time mean to all of this. She remembered that she began to worry because she was late for something and she was driving faster than the speed limit. That she was worried that a police officer might see her car and she knew she was speeding and she admitted that. And that she had been concerned and was watching her speedometer. And here was a sentence and she said, I do remember that the speedometer seemed to go out of focus, just like that. And that was the key to unlocking her completely shut down memory. Uh, and I'm trying to remember whether it was a Bud Hopkins case or Leo Sprinkle or whoever did it. That's what they used. That's how they got into an enormous abduction story was through the memory of the seeing her speedometer, speedometer out of focus. 
if, if you back out of it, and this is all speculation, and that we are dealing with intelligences that know how to move gravity point to gravity point, portal to portal in the universe. And if they do it traveling at the speed of light at 186,000 miles a second or faster, they stop time. And there is something about the many decades that all of us who have been investigating animal mutilations and human abductions, that there are parallels about if you are advanced and you can stop time by going to the speed of light, that you can dip into and out of the speed of light to control even your own aging, that you could use the speed of light to stop time as well as manipulate time, then the beams that have been seen by so many different people around the planet, especially in the animal mutilation category, where ranchers, whether it's Peru or Brazil or Argentina or in the United States, there's many eyewitnesses to seeing a beam coming out of something in the sky that appears to be round lights, puts this beam and they see an animal go up. Could it be that the beam technology, the whole UFO ability to manipulate space time, to stop time, control time, move forward and backward in time, that maybe we have a real limitation because we aren't doing that and we can't quite comprehend what that means. But that time manipulation could be the answer to some of the bloodless, trackless animal mutilations. I completely agree with the value of the question. And then on the other side of all of this is If our government and other governments have known that on our planet we are cohabiting a planet with a mixture of other intelligences and that there are others that come from other places because Earth is like a laboratory and that they have this ability that and we make a decision, the power brokers, the human power brokers, that the technology is more important than humans. You begin to step around what may be at the core of why I sense that Homo sapien and Homo sapien sapien this one we are an abused species because we have been denied knowledge about all of this, about the, even the nature of our universe, which may be a hologram projected from another dimension. And one of the ironies in talking with Eddie Abbott is that that motto for his brigade, knowledge is strength. Knowledge is power. Knowledge gives freedom. And so much of what the truth is about what is really happening inside, around, outside in our solar system is being denied to the general human family. Time travel, neutralizing gravity, being able to project holograms that nobody knows that they aren't holograms, being able to pass life force back and forth between genetically created body containers to move around Earth in the camouflage of a human body, to evolve hybrids. Suddenly, if you say all of this 
is the creation of hybrids for something else's value, goal. It would explain when Robert Bigelow was on 60 Minutes a couple of years ago and was being interviewed by a reporter who said, do you really believe in aliens? And Robert Bigelow answered, they are here right under your nose. And everybody wondered what he meant. It could be that we're not just cohabiting with a bunch of other non-humans from other places in the universe that have been using this planet for at least 270 million years. It could be that one of the big programs is the evolution of hybrids and hybrids among us. I don't know, it doesn't scare me, it doesn't bother me, but these are all the facets of the complexity of everything that is and has grown out of seeing strange lights in the sky, silver, cylinder, whatever the shapes and being a human family living on the surface of the planet with nobody in power positions telling us that there are all kinds of intelligences that use our planet and go on, don't worry, we're alone in the universe. There's something unfair about that. But never give up. That's my motto, never give up keep going and asking questions. I think we have time for one more. Somebody was wondering if you had an update on the drones in Colorado, Iowa, and other states. Have the, have the sightings actually stopped or are they just not being reported anymore? Well, I have kept in touch for a while with um, the rancher up in Hagler, Nebraska, Alex Peterson, and he thought that after the, uh, we'll, we'll say that there were the FOIA, these disclosures that came out, that everything quieted down, but that off and on, he thought that maybe he was seeing lights that would be in the category of drones over his very rural, uh, remote ranch. He, he, this is, uh, uh, again, this is speculation because we all need hard facts and they are so difficult to come by. There had to be some kind of an organized operation to explain what happened from December through January. There were so many eyewitnesses. And for those of you who were coming to Earth Files in following the work that I was doing in Earth Files, uh, you probably remember the mother with her, she was going to go, uh, I think she was picking up one of her children at school and she went down to the curb and there in the sky in the direction where she was headed was uh, oval white and she went, did the school pick up and she took a photo or two, which uh, I think a little bit of video, and got back to the house. And in just that short period of time, it was, it was a small town. It had been there. She had seen it. She had photographed it, videotaped it. And then it seemed to just disappear. That is not classically a drone as we think of drones. What was that? Was there a mixture of different kinds of technologies for reasons unknown? And the very beginning of that phenomena, remember when people were talking about that, they, uh, Alex noticed this, straight lines like grids, that there was grid patterns seemed to be involved. Well, did, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that come. We didn't know in December that COVID was going to come crashing down on us. Would there be anything that the government in its 
policies of denial and silence about all of these sort of things that would grid operations with drones be accomplishing investigating something that is going to relate to what's going to open up in newspapers in three or four weeks. I don't know. But there were, that phenomena was so odd because for about two weeks it was vivid and a lot of people uh, were reporting. And then it seemed to start dissolving away into when people start putting video and photos on the web for money, for clicks, then it all begins to sour and things disintegrate. But there was the report that came through with those documents toward the end that seemed to indicate that there was a great deal of interest in what kind of drone activity there was in Colorado, Nebraska, and that area. And if the government agencies at local, state, and federal did not know, what was it? Even if it was, or looked like, drones, they didn't seem to know anything about what it was. So in my book, there is still a mystery from, Janu or from December into January about what was running grid patterns what was the white round oval object? What was the mixed pattern? And why would that part of the United States be focused on for that short period of time without anything ever really coming forward that was this is who, why, what? It hasn't happened. So I guess I say to everybody out there, if you uh, ever see in where you live, in your community, something that you think is repeating drone activity, multiple drone activity, uh, let me know. Uh, there are ways uh, to do investigations that I can do through people who help. But I would like to know, let, let's throw it back to you, the wonderful world audience, before we say goodbye. If there's anybody out there who knows some facts and can prove some facts about what happened in the Colorado, Nebraska, Wyoming area for uh, whatever the drone mystery was, and you want to communicate with me through hard mail or through proton mail, do that. We all need help with understanding what the truth is and the facts are at this difficult time on the world where we're waking up to how much we've been denied in terms of facts and truth about the evolution of this planet and that it is becoming clearer and clearer now. And for those of you who care like I do about facts and truth, help me. Get that to me, and I will look forward to bringing you next week part two with Eddie Abbott, and I think you will find it extraordinary. Love you.